देर आर फिफ्टीन पीपल इन दिस कंट्री हु आर फॉर फ्री स्पीच अनफॉर्चुनेटली सबसे ज्यादा गाली मेरे को और आनंद रंगनाथन को मिलती है पता नहीं क्यों सर मैं और आनंद ही गाली खाते रहते हैं इसमें भी आई हैव हैंडल दैट इज डेडिकेटेड टू हेट मी एवरी टाइम आई ट्वीट Everybody is internally become a Ravish Kumar. You know, कौन जात हो? Somebody did a survey who is a bigger doggy, and the doggy was spelled D O G H H I E. Was it Harsh Bhavishri Singh Gupta or Kushal Mehra? I clearly remember it was like 11:30, 12 in the night. I messaged her. I was like, "Dek, cheating me करना? Like a good friend, I voted for you. You better vote for me, and then let the best man win." And I won that. And then I could get remember rubbing it into her. I was like, "Dek, I am the bigger doggy. You lost me." अरे दलित से ना बहुत इमोशनल होते हैं. Dalits can't study. Dalits can't do this. And you know, we upper castes are forcing rationality on them. I am a westernized christianized secularized this eyesed that eyes i am keep the abuses coming i don't care i'm privileged to be joined by two very special guests today who need absolutely no introduction kushal mehra and prerna tilwai party A very good morning to you, Paji, and uh, good evening. Uh, sorry, it's the other way around. Good evening, Paji, and uh, good morning, Prerna Ka. Good evening. Thank you. How are things in uh, Canada? You're you're there right now. Well, it's 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 weather is nice uh, as far as I'm concerned. So you know, I'm away from the rainy season of Mumbai. So that so this is perfect timing, right? It rains in Mumbai, I end up in Canada. By the time it starts getting cold in Canada, I'm back in Mumbai. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about you, uh, Prerna Ji? Because Hyderabad is in the news of late, and uh, for very disturbing reasons. And the last couple of times we spoke as well, it's not really good news that we actually discussed. Right. Thank you so much, Shail, for having me on your show. Uh, yes, as you know, what is happening in Hyderabad is there are there there's communal riots going on because a comedian came here and uh, performed, and now the police is just going berserk. There was stone pelting on the cops as well. Yeah. So, Plus, this uh, Raja Singh's controversy came up yesterday. You no, know, well, yes. the entire Sartan se juda. It's actually, uh, I think many people, including journalists, didn't know that uh, the the term originates from Pakistan and has nothing to do with the Islamic scriptures per se, as as it as it's actually uh, wrongfully cited. Uh, but it, it's it's definitely worrying if there is a mob which is chanting there all day and trying to normalize it. They are pelting stones at the cops. So the cops also now they have decided they are going inside the house. They are breaking the door. We have videos that have surfaced where the cops are breaking the door and entering the house of the stone pelters and arresting them. So it's pretty bad. Okay. But um, we will discuss that a little later. Today, the reason why uh, we are having this conversation is that there is this. polarization happening not just uh, on social media but generally in terms of how these perception wars are fought uh, in terms of how narratives are formed on uh, caste discrimination and other things generally on social media and the younger generation is generally divided between these two groups which are largely being formed and there is uh, the dilution of a certain narrative to such an extent that uh any form of discrimination is being actively denied uh and anybody who actually supports uh, uh you know this su- supports any sort of uh justice against any form of these prejudices is actually looked down upon as a leftist as a liberal or whatever and i think that sets a very wrong precedent uh so where where do you think uh it actually began from i mean what set this trend forward Uh, mm-hmm. Who wants to take this first, Prerna? You want to go first? No, Kushal, you please go ahead first. All right. So as far as I'm concerned, it was very interesting that you know I had made this uh, 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 quote unquote prophetic prediction 
to a good friend uh, who of mine, Harsh Madhusudan Gupta, a few years ago. Um, I I think it was like four or five years ago. Jabmane, I know I told Harsh. He's like, Harsh, in India, there's going to be this particular mindset that's going to come. And it's going to be based on a new form of negationism. And he's like, what do you mean negationism? So I was like, first, let me tell you where the term, I learned the term from Dr. Conrad Elst. So Dr. Conrad Elst had a while ago, long time ago, written on the negationism of the record of Islam in India, right? Uh, if people remember, it's a wonderful book. And he, you know, he, he, he said it beautifully, how in India, there is a conscious effort from what is loosely called the left in India uh, that negates the record of Islam in India and Islamism in India in, in very particular. So if, if somebody was to point mm -hmm. out about the atro atrocities committed by, uh, you know, the Mughals or the Timurids or the Turks or whatever we want to call them, you know, they are denied. They're like, Aisa kuch nahi tha. You know, everybody was holding hands and singing Kumbaya and dancing in the aisles or the Punjabis were doing Balle Balle or the Southern Indians were doing their own version of, of whatever they were doing. So it, it's always been like that. And and I remember telling Harsh, and unfortunately Harsh is not here, otherwise he would have backed me up on this one. But, you know, I said, there is a negationism that is happening in India parallelly. And he was like, or concern negationism, and you know, he was like, This is usually the name. I was like, The record of casteism in India and where it yes. originates, how it originates, and there is a there is a very solid academic. So uh, I don't mean to say this in a pejorative way. Let me be very clear. I mean to say this in a very serious way and appreciative way that there is a solid academic effort to deny this record of casteism in India because, and the denial is coming, going to come not from the left. It is going to come from what I like to call the non-left. So if I was to right. be very honest, I, I trace it back to at least 30, 40 years since a serious academic effort started from the, the what is loosely called the non-left academic uh, Hindu side where and I don't like taking names because that's not my nature. Sure. I don't like taking names. Sure. But serious books started being written uh, with a very honest and a very well-meaning purpose. First of all, the purpose of writing those books was very honest and very well-meaning. And it was looking at the discourse on caste. And let me tell you, a lot of things that were pointed out in those works were actually legitimate also. Right. when it comes to the discussion around caste. But what has happened is, like everything percolates into its straw man. You know how everything has a straw man version. Uh, and usually the straw man versions come in the pop culture. Right? Yeah. See, pop culture, mein kaisa hota hai? pop culture, mein there is no nuance. Pop culture, mein there is only the generalized version. And what happens is, what happens in the academic level then gets picked up. And that picks, uh, and then people do what, is commonly called court mining. Mm. So you know how I'll give you an example. Ambedkar is a classic case of court mining in India. Yeah. You know, the, every oh, side abuse. uses Ambedkar. Yeah. You know, every side uses Ambedkar. So the non-left will use Ambedkar and his book on Pakistan, right? They will mm. use his book on Pakistan. They will completely ignore Ambedkar and his views on Hinduism. Yeah. It, it is like you know, अरे नहीं नहीं ये तो ना book है, ये book है. And the left will completely ignore Ambedkar's views on Pakistan and they will only talk about his views on Hinduism. So it's it's yeah. very common in Hindu. So I believe that this negationism, in my view, at a serious academic level, when it comes from the non because see, let's be very clear. We're talking about non-left negationism and denialism. We're not the left is not denying casteism in India. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> they're not. It, they're not. It's, uh, the, the, the left is denying Islamism in India. So we have to be very clear that the non-left is mm -hmm. trying to, and I'm not saying the serious academics are trying to deny the record of caste in India, but what happens in the percolation and the pop culture level and the straw manning of their arguments is a serious denialism of casteism is happening. And I personally feel it is based out of no evidence at all. Yeah. And uh, it it so happens that you know some people say that um, without taking names again because this this seems to be the narrative of late 
uh, anybody who says this is actively cancelled and says that you know we are brahmins and we still go through persecution or any other class or community for that matter but we don't have that agency but i don't think it's the same as denying brahmins an agency you can have that agency yes brahmins are also targeted uh, to a very large extent in different parts but that does not mean that you actually go out and actively deny that some sort of discrimination actually exists in different cases uh, the classic example was recently when that controversy happened because of that one particular incident and i remember you had tweeted out uh, and it's okay to be wrong because ultimately it depends on the investigation who report aata hai then uh, ultimately the fact of the matter can be something else uh but i saw the kind of comments that were driven against people who were actually whether it's you and harsh and it's actually sort of disturbing because you are not sitting there ki acha aaj to kuch to case hoga so i can prove my point right so that, that's 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 really disheartening uh, so where do you see this going uh, prena do you want to take that yeah so uh, i agree with what kushal just said that you know the denialism of caste especially in the non left um and i guess you're talking about that incident in rajasthan where the uh, student was not allowed to drink water yeah uh, later on ground reports were coming out only i think the non left portals online portals uh, uh, covered it and said that uh, the teacher was dalit as well not just the student the one who hit him was also a dalit and apparently there was some problem in the, in the boy's ear and that led to his death so there's so many different narratives so that is a clear example of what kushal just said you know there is denialism over here whereas over there they try to completely blame everything on to the uh, brahmin so uh, yeah that is happening a lot but what is the solution is what we are after the minute a news like this comes out the left media just pounces on it and then they'll be like look there is casteism you guys this is what you guys do even after so many years of independence a student was killed he could not drink water so what has changed from ambedkar to now yeah. after a week or so it comes out that that was not the case same thing happened with hathras so there are multiple incidents where you know the minute it is a hindu on hindu atrocity the left will try and search for a caste um uh, yeah. in the in that story If there's any atrocity, first thing they ask is, "What is the caste of the victim?" Same thing if it is a Hindu victim and the aggressor is Muslim, then they will not even write the name of the aggressor. Yeah. And then, of course, there's this poll thing where people like Asad Oasi and others, you know, talk about Jai Bhim and Jai Meen. That is the biggest farce ever. so far there is not even a single incident to prove that jaimin jaimin you know the thing is working and you know dalits are being held by muslims or muslims are coming and helping dalits in fact you see the number of atrocities on dalits by non hindus happens by muslims yeah i i don't think uh, uh, as far as the institutional training goes whether it's in journalism or different uh, fields of humanity that actually make an impact in terms of narrative setting right I don't see that changing because I'll give you my own example. Uh, in the journalism course that I studied, I uh, I studied in a very Catholic institution, so you can naturally imagine the kind of crowd <laughs> that's going to be there. Ninety nine percent of the crowd is left leaning, uh, for at least uh, fashion sake. You know, they're very fashionably leftists. So uh, many of us who uh, supported certain policies of Mr. Modi, this was back in fourteen and fifteen when we were starting off in college, we were called uh, closet sangis. Uh, <laughs> so then finally we decided to come out of the closet because we were anyway being called that <laughs> but that's that's what uh, but, but in journalism schools what we are taught uh, taught is that you should not use certain names of perpetrators especially if they're minorities because uh, they are being persecuted and all of that you need to give them that extra agency you need to give them that extra privilege so we are actively being taught what to do what not to do so it's not as if these biases are inherent or you, you know you know they they sort of carry that from their childhood or something it's actively uh, driven it's actively educated in many of these schools uh, especially in academia and unless we actually try to change that sector i mean youtube pe we can make all of those videos but 
very few people are actually putting those efforts where in academia such uh, active changes can be reflected in terms of writing books and all of that uh, but in terms of how this narrative has been changing since the last few years and i don't mean to make you feel old uh, kushal ji but uh, <laughs> you know since you are the most senior among us uh, there have been certain phases in our history uh, whether it's uh, when vajpay was in power or back then uh, during swatantra party when a non left narrative started to be set uh, certain ideas were being challenged in the mainstream uh, how do you see that evolving with time especially in the hindu right ecosystem oh i think there is things have changed so much man if you just think about it like growing up we would not even you know, we would not even dare to have certain thoughts <laughs> let alone write certain thoughts we would not dare to have those thoughts if if they would come in our mind we would cancel them we were canceling ourselves like now it is very different man look uh, i i clearly remember when ram janmu bhumi happened like i had the first whiff of my my consciousness as a hindu i i did not feel anything beyond okay there is something called the hindu identity that was what happened to me when ram janmu bhumi happened and obviously uh, look i'm not going to lie and say some you know my parents used to make me read the newspaper i never read the newspaper you know i am not one of i am a very late bloomer when it comes to reading things i started reading at the age of 20 but i read a lot right. now so but i i was just that typical boy who would pick up the newspaper look at what is written on sachin tendulkar yeah read cricket i could care less about any other sport so <laughs> my consciousness was only ki there is something happening and things are changing i started following politics only when i left india and i went to canada to study in the year 2000 that's when i started you know realizing i was made to realize i was a hindu when i left india they they, they made sure they real, made me realize that believe me mm-hmm. when i went there you know when a christian me see i never experienced conversion in india i was living in mumbai abhi abhi main kaise bolu you know you don't feel these things but when i came to university somebody told me that i am going to hell i was like first of all let me find out what hell is <laughs> <laughs> you know what hell is maybe it's a nice place maybe i want to live there so let me find it out so my journey is different my consciousness changed but mm. i believe as far as the media landscape is concerned i think things have changed so much look for example right now we have a swarajya for example mm. we have a swarajya today what did we have yaar i mean i remember center right india i remember reading center right india i i am that prani who used to read center right india you know See. i would read what amar had to say or what vijay used to write and and one prasanna used to write like i remember those days so clearly mm. and how sunanda used to write at times i remember sunanda vashist used to write a lot at that time but i'm just mm. dropping names because i am taken back to that time yeah. when this was there i like i joined social media 2010 and you know it what we have today in terms of a media ecosystem because i'm only sticking to that man it could not be better i mean i am able to host a podcast by, right. which by the blessings of my family members and the support of many people as you know it has created a small voice albeit a small one and there are so many beautiful youtubers that are blooming there you know in the regional language space whether it's telugu youtubers there are tamil youtubers there are hindi youtubers then there's obviously in english language we have it you know and and there is such a blossoming of content creation now you just you know you just have to go and see and uh, in in hindi there is you know the word swad anusar you know as per your taste you mm. can find a youtuber you can find a portal as per your taste now it was not the case at least a decade ago tell me what were, what did you have i mean it started off with center right india yaar it yeah. started off with media crooks and center right india bashing the mainstream media or or criticizing the mainstream media to today you have such a robust proper outlet like swaraj and, and you know i mm. it i know it's not mine but i feel personal pr- pride that you know swaraj something like swaraj exists it is it is a matter of personal pride yeah. that you know something is standing so personally it is the best time best time to be in the non left space like there are people like me who are so vocal about the annihilation of jati varna i don't even use caste right and i know this will piss off people the moment i have used this word there will be a certain crowd inside the non left that will be piss off but i can be what i am 
and there are still people who consume my content too and then there are people who are vehemently opposed to me or my point of view some get very abusive others get critical but not abusive and you know they also have a following i mean isn't that we all what we wished for i mean how can it be better than this i don't know yeah no in, in the younger crowd in swaraj as well when i'm uh, talking to some of my colleagues they're absolutely unaware uh, what center right india was because you know they they only identify swaraj as a success story in the right uh, but some of us who are slightly senior uh, do know how the story actually evolved it was completely a struggle because even the reactions i remember because 4 or 5 years ago when i was a college student i interned in swarajya many of them even i mean the mode was a startup mode i think we are still in a startup mode because media usually takes that long to be established i mean if the hindu is what the hindu is it took them 70 80 years to actually get there so it's not easy for the credibility to be established uh, you know overnight so it's a very positive change it's a it's it's actually breathtaking in terms of uh, what has happened in the last 10 years regardless of how much people criticize ki bjp ecosystem create nahi kiya and all of that you know I mean, but uh, it's a, 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 is that the bjp's job or not it's a matter of it's a matter of debate it's a natural evolution i i would say because the bjp can't control a lot of these things even if they try to i mean no matter i mean whoever whoever it is uh, i think one more interesting takeaway from what we, what you just said is that uh post 90s especially the post mandal commission all those millennials who are born it's inherently uh, rooted within us that caste is a part of our daily conversation that reservations will exist and the only way that we could get away with reservations or the idea of caste discrimination was only in essay writing competition in schools beyond that no practical policy changes were actually even thought of because this sort of a policy we thought would be somewhat more permanent maybe you will not be able to relate to it but we'll be able to relate to it because this is the mentality that the 90s kids and the 2000s kids actually have so how do you see this distinction and how do you see this going forward prerna so speaking about the millennials at least what i see is on social media regarding the class the old topic is being discussed and um the minute we start to discuss caste the conversation all automatically goes towards reservation so speaking of millennials who are there on social media the, the biggest problem that they have with caste is not the not denialism or anything it is reservation so they feel that yeah. their uh, opportunity uh, at getting into a good college or getting into a good government job has been snatched away uh, by the uh, dalit community so this is what is happening on social media whereas if you see on the ground the dalit community are them themselves are not aware about the sort of reservation that they are entitled to have they are not aware about the different uh, schemes that the government has you know started for the development of the dalit community yeah. so what we believe is uh, you know the dalit community is you know making full use of the reservation but in reality that's not the case mm. the benefits that the government is providing or the reservation that they are entitled to they are not aware of it it is not yeah. limited to the lowest or to the most rural areas yeah so rural areas people are still not aware well uh, they do have their aadhar card they have the pan card they have you know the health yellow card pink card and everything but when it actually comes to practically getting their children into a school or into a college they're mm-hmm. not really aware about the schemes and what they they are entitled to yeah in fact uh, it's it's very interesting that you bring this up because uh, i read a recent report i don't know where it was published but basically it reflected on uh, the caste policies and how Uh, we've progressed as a society especially 30 years after the mandal commission report actually came out and it said that one criticism of uh, of the entire reservation policy is that you know the creamy layer is getting a lot of privileges and all of that although there has been uh, a lot of efforts to eliminate uh, the privileges that the creamy layer get but a large section of whether it's obcs or different communities who have certain caste reservations do not use the caste reservation 
uh, facility until they uh, reach a certain point of privilege. And, you know, collective uh, household income is actually taken, but individually there may be a lot of uh, problems between a daughter and a, a dad. There may be problems and the daughter would want to use that facility going forward to secure her own future. So these are, what do you think are the drawbacks and what do you think needs a rework on uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the reservation policies today? Basically, if uh, you're speaking about reservation, I still don't know what is this creamy layer in the Dalit community. There is actually no creamy layer. If you're just looking at a couple of political families and saying that this is a creamy layer, I don't think, you know, that holds true for all, for the entire Dalit community. So, like I said before, a lot of them are not aware that they can avail reservation. So the question of creamy layer doesn't arise because there might be a few people, you know, like we keep seeing there's an IAS officer, the father is an IAS officer, uh, he's a Dalit, then the child has also gone and availed uh, for reservation. You will have, you know, minimum cases that you'll see uh, where, you know, the family is already established and they're still going in for reservation. In fact, there's also another thing called uh, no more four. So where the fourth generation is not going to, uh, you know, avail any sort of reservation. If the first three generations have availed for uh, reservation and uh, Dalit, uh, you know, privileges, the fourth is not going to. So that's something that is going on. The younger generation of Dalits is uh, actively, you know, uh, going for this. And also the thing is, what happens is when there is a, Dal a Dalit person gets into a good college, gets a good education and also makes it in life, people around that person will still say that, you know what, this has all happened because of reservation. Whether the, whether the person is, has taken reservation or not, the fact that you're a Dalit automatically means that you have gotten to wherever you are because of reservation. So no matter what happens, you're never going to be good enough. So yeah. what is the creamy layer? I really don't know. Because I have personally seen it in my family as well. Uh, they're gold medalists, they've studied really well, they've gotten good jobs and everything. But then again, you know, people will say, hey, these people have just gotten it because of reservation. If not for reservation, they wouldn't have gotten this far. Yeah. So that that's a big uh, problem that, you know, the community faces. Right. They're not going to be good enough no matter what. Yeah. You know, when we are having these conversations, it only makes me think, uh, and it may be a very personal experience, so I may actually be wrong about this. Uh, please do correct me, uh, Kushal Bhaiya, if I'm wrong. Uh, I see a lot of NRIs actively denying that any sort of caste discrimination actually happened. Okay, their point is that caste is a Portuguese word, blah, 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 British invented it. Okay, fine, whatever terminology you want to use. But the point is, was there active discrimination or not? I mean, to a certain extent or, you know, occasionally, frequently, that all of that may be debatable. But why is it that... Uh, this sort of attitude is generally reflected outside of India, especially uh, by the Indian diaspora, because we don't see that much happening uh, in India. So is there a particular reason behind that? Well, it's very simple. You look at the the dynamics as far as the caste breakup is concerned. First of all, I'm going to try to present, in, you know, it's. I'm so happy you've asked me this question because anyways, I'm going to do a monologue about this on my own podcast where I'm going to give a one-hour answer for this. I mean, Prerna knows my thoughts now for a while because, you know, Prerna and I have had so many offline discussions on this subject and it's very interesting. The only person who kind of understands what I say beyond the point is actually Prerna. She actually understands what I say on this subject because she is actually a diaspora Hindu. She is somebody who has lived in the diaspora. So she actually understood right. what I was saying. So see, first of all, we have to be very fair. The breakup of, you know, diaspora Hindus, caste wise, let's, uh, this is not a voice of Caribbean Hindus. I'll be very clear. Caribbean Hindus are not going around saying caste is a Western construct. No, they're not saying that. Let's be very clear. There might be ikka yeah. dukka here and there. Magar uh, Caribbean Hindus ki aap agar caste breakup check karoge, matab, where did they come from? Who were they when they went and migrated to the Caribbean islands? They mm. were agricultural laborers. So so you can connect what, yeah. what caste and you, you know what the discourse will be over there. This, mm -hmm. this particular voice of 
you know british construct castas portuguese whatever etc ityadi full stop punctuation mark whatever you want to add it only emanates from western europe and north america right. western europe north america and if you want to add england as a separate entity i i included england in western europe basically it only emanates from here because even if you do the breakdown i i am sorry to break it to people and break their heart but if you did a jati based breakdown it has been done in north america there are enough surveys to show that by the way overwhelmingly and it's not by design it is just by accident that this has happened so i am not blaming the diaspora for this i am actually sympathizing with the diaspora it is not their fault that they all happen to be what is loosely called the general category in india it is not their fault right it is it they, it is not like all the all the general categories you know they were twirling their mustaches and like machiavellians or cautelians <laughs> whatever depending on your uh, inclination if you are very indic then then like cautelians or or if you are very colonized you are very machiavellian whatever you want to use you know they were sitting there somewhere in mumbai delhi chennai whatever you know and they were like we are going to migrate out of india systematically no 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 it is not like that it just happened whatever you know they might be the ones who had privileges in india whatever you know they went there and they came here now what has happened over the years is that they have landed in a society whether you like it or not which is built on abrahamic societies and abrahamic structures i'm not talking about the american constitution that's like a kick in the behind to abrahamism in many ways and the french constitution but the society largely is abrahamic so mm-hmm. no matter what the case you're just a pagan in this society they don't know your jat let's be very clear you know prerna has lived outside india uh, her her caste consciousness <laughs> even you know on my own podcast with prerna she said i got my caste consciousness when i went to india <laughs> i was so happy <laughs> outside india there was no caste there so right. so so we cannot entirely blame them but what has happened is there is a section and believe me this section is not the white folks doing this to indians outside india this is a section of indians itself who have gone yeah. ultra woke like they are woke on steroids <laughs> no no they are woke on steroids and they have started beating indians up you know everybody is internally become a ravish kumar you know kaun jaat ho everybody is going around like ravish kumar going gone kaun jaat ho and now the disease has started <laughs> happening with small babies in the school like you know if you're a child just think about it right if you are a father or a mother just think about the scenario that you are a kid going to school and suddenly randomly somebody just because you're a hindu says what caste are you are i did not even know i don't have any so now what has happened is there could have been two responses to it right the standard normal response could have been look I don't have any caste consciousness. I am not for that system. Hinduism is beyond caste, and our Hinduism that we practice over here, because the moment you cross that plane, right, and you land over here, they can't even figure out who's a Pakistani and an Indian, right? You, I mean, even Ambedkar, if you remember, Ambedkar yeah. had famously said, right, the uh, when I landed in America, they hated me because of my skin color, not because of my caste. right you know ambedkar also realized that when he came over here hey, he's like i was back in india and they immediately reminded me of my caste so that's right. ambedkar the same thing uh, you know i just spoke uh, to uh, dr bayatoram on my podcast and he also said that when the you know hindus went outside to the caribbean islands they were pretty much working on the fields irrespective of what caste they were they were all indentured laborers irrespective of whatever caste they belong to so your caste was nullified outside india but what has happened is because of this very bad attack on the community and that is stemming because basically the hindu community has now become the richest minority in north america you know numbers don't lie yeah so now in the operation olympics landscape they are <laughs> called white adjacent now there are like today you know sharan you won't believe it there was a horrendous crime against a poor hindu man on a taco bell today today that i am recording this chat with you i tweeted that video also uh, obviously aap so rahe the so you have not seen it and there was a i think khalistani that's what is reported he was you know using the most worse slurs uh, on our uh, cow and etc etc and he was abusing that person and luckily that person i think because of harassment and everything of that poor hindu has been arrested but you know 
they are facing these things and then they are rising so for this ultra woke ideology they they started yeah. hitting you with the caste thingy now, mm. now the, the there could have been different ways we would have responded or could have responded to this particular phenomenon right there are multiple ways mm. we could have responded to it but we chose the worst way to respond to it Right. So basically what we did was we look at how they place it. We look at their mm. epistemology and we use their epistemology and flipped it on them. And we said yeah. it is a British construct. And then, you know, you have the standard books by Nicholas Dirks, uh, Jacob D. Ruver. I mean, I have read them all personally. Like, and it's the same. It's, it's see, it's the same postmodern framework. Yeah. It's the same postmodern framework. And, Unfortunately, the diaspora is completely addicted to it. They are addicted to the victimhood narrative. They just want to show that they are victims. And, and because yeah. I think it's a perfect way to deal with the caste narrative in their view, because when you mm. talk to them, they, they tell me that, Kushal, you don't understand. When we go and tell them, they only understand certain language. So just like there is Islamophobia, so now we have to talk about Hindu phobia. I mean, mm. we could not come up with an original word. We came up with phobia, phobia, copy, cut, paste. Yeah. So Islamophobia is Hindu phobia now. So everybody is trying to tackle with a problem in that sense. So, you know, unfortunately, I mean, I don't know why they thought that the Savarkar way of dealing with it was not good. I don't know why. I mean, yeah. the Savarkar answer or maybe the Dhanan Saraswati answer or the Swami Vivekananda answer was not good enough. It's 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 mm. absurd to me, but what do I do now? They they have become denialists, and and if you listen to the commentary in the diaspora, it's actually quite comedy to me. I mean, I mm. just find it funny personally. Like, and it's not like they don't deny it. Yeah, but they don't want to talk about it either. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've had some really funny experiences. I've had people justifying open defecation on my show, and the person took serious offense because. Uh, you know, they, she uh, she was quoting some Vedas and Shastras and said that. A, open a, defecation. A minute, what did I just hear? Open defecation was justified? Yeah. Sort of indirectly, she was trying to justify open oh. defecation. saying. So, that... so basically, matlab, doing potty in a bathroom is a Western construct. And doing potty outside is an Indian construct. So there's been ridiculous amounts of uh, experiences that I've personally had because I'm I'm also a sociology student. So when you hear these things, you want to hit your head against the wall, right? But what I want to ask you is how legitimate are these in terms of how, how much credibility does all of this hold or is it limited to eco chambers? Because I see a lot of publications outside uh, of India in the Indian diaspora published in Canada, US and UK. So does this actually get into the mainstream? in terms of creating a citation loop or is it just they're all restricted to YouTube and oh, social media? The, the, the citation loop is happening. The citation loop is very worrying uh, and the diaspora doesn't understand it. I, I genuinely believe the diaspora doesn't understand it. The di Look, the diaspora is desperate. The diaspora is desperate is because they they genuinely are not at fault. They genuinely are not at fault. I, I, I am living here now for two months. I have gone on talks. I have... I think I must have driven at least five, 6,000 kilometers with my wife all across North America uh, in the last two months, and it's going to continue. And I have met families, like, I'll share a small incident, and I think Prerna will also appreciate this. So I did a talk in Toronto. It genuinely broke my heart what happened to me. So there's these small kids, huh? school-going kids, six to nine on age, six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, nine years, nine years. And you know, that small kid, Southern Indian kid, two girls they come alone alag se. like the father was there but they say uncle can i talk to you i was like ha beta please they're like i'm scared to be a hindu that broke my heart you know when a bacha see that bacha has no caste consciousness the kid has no caste consciousness and where you know it broke my heart that the child feels like that and secondly that what breaks my heart is then you have scholars who say caste is a western construct so you're doubly harming them. It's, it's, you know, it's not like, you know, you go and put your foot on the axe. You drive 200 kilometers in traffic. You spend a few hours, waste your life. Then you find an axe and jump on it. You are doubly harming your children. Look, 
I always give the example of the Ambedkar and Savarkar discussion on discrimination. So Ambedkar yeah. was spot on in his analysis and he said, look, you know, Brahmins do this, do this, this. Savarkar just pointed out one thing that Mr. Ambedkar, I am all for annihilation of caste, but I am not just for annihilation of Brahmins discriminating against the so-called lower caste, right? I am also mm -hmm. for in Maharashtra, like Ambedkar's caste was Mahar. Then yeah. there was something called the Mang caste. So what Savarkar said that if we want to annihilate, we have to annihilate the Mang or the Mahar discriminating too. Like why, why do we hide that when it comes to actual violence, inter-caste violence in India, why are we hiding that a significant chunk is actually OBCs being violent on SCSTs? Are we going to deny government data now? Are, are we really going to deny all the government data, tomes of data that, that clearly records that the OBCs are actually, when it comes to these attacks, are are doing those are I'm not saying all OBCs do it, but I'm saying that's what the data yeah. shares, right? And that could be because also because OBCs are more in number in terms Correct. of so I, I understand yeah. the statistical issue there, but the point is that our answer to this problem should have been we want to annihilate the system. We had Ambedkar, we had Savarkar who gave us these answers. Okay, I understand people have jati based traditions, jati based rituals. I am not saying I want annihilation of rituals. Please do not misunderstand me. You can continue, but are you telling me, let's say, you know, okay, I am open charvak, but mm -hmm. I go to Mandir. I should not. I should not go and, you know, bow down to a temple idol. I may not see divinity in it, right? I may not see divinity in it. But is the purest Hindu so purest that they hate the idea that a person who does not see a divine in a murti still wants to bow down to a murti because he loves his culture? I love Krishna. I may not think he's a god, but I love Krishna. My life is on Bhagavad Gita. So my point is that what kind of a society are we trying to build and this diaspora denialism because of all the problems the diaspora has are genuine. Where I start differing with the diaspora is this apologia for caste. I mean, hierarchies are universal, man. The Plato's Republic spoke about the three-tier system where the lowest rung was the auxiliaries and they also did not want, you know, people intermingling. Even the Plato's yeah. Republic had it. The British have an active class system even today. The British even to date have an active class system. I recently shared an article on my Twitter. I don't know how many have read it about the active caste system in Japan. It is in Japan. Then you come to America. There is a Jati in America also. Right. There is a Jati of the elite Americans. Mm. That is a Jati too. And the elite Americans in the social sciences and all those areas, they don't... Today, I saw a horrendous video of the biggest, you know, woke Rani on planet Earth, Robin D'Angelo. I call mm. her woke Rani because she is, you know, she is the <laughs> headmistress of uh, wokeism. That woman literally, you know, in a video, all basically what she was trying to insinuate is African Americans have emotions. And you know, white people are into too much rationality and data and they, they are suppressing black people. Are you trying to tell me African-Americans are incapable of rationality now? <laughs> I mean, imagine how condescending that woman is. You know, the Indian yeah. version of this would be what? A person like me would be going, Are Dalit are very emotional. Hote hai. Dalits can't study. Dalits can't do this. And you know, we upper castes are forcing rationality on them. This is how condescending the discourse is. So we, mm -hmm. as the idea is we should acknowledge the fluidity of hierarchies and we should want that. And you know, both sides, the, the left that beats the Hindu up, and the non-left that beats the left up and comes up with these apologia, both of them yeah. are having one common factor. They think Hinduism is a unicorn. Mm. One side believes Hinduism is the biggest evil which only came up. They were so brilliant, they came up with this hierarchy. Only hierarchies exist in Hinduism. Nowhere else do we see these hierarchies. And the non-left thinks Hinduism is so awesome that there were no hierarchies. We were all doing bhangra. I have never come across a stupider discourse in my life. There are two things. One is that, uh, Kushal, and I, uh, I think you heard a large part of the conversation. So just taking forward from there, uh, yes. one is that there's an emerging polity of Savarna appeasement, both from the left and the non-left today, uh, because of whatever reason, electoral reasons or uh, political reasons, or it can be whatever. 
Uh, and the other thing is that the subaltern assertion today is being weakened uh, because of that said appeasement. So would the two go in hand or are they two, uh, you know, uniquely different factors happening parallelly? No, I, I really don't see where is this uh, uh, Savarna appeasement actually happening. In fact, the problem that a lot of Hindus have with BJP, they belong to the Savarna community. Please correct me if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, Shushar. If you notice, it is the upper caste and, uh, you know, privileged Hindu who actually hates uh, uh, BJP and Modi ji. And the subaltern have actually gotten a voice ever since Modi ji has come into power. In fact, when they were when there was the uh, Congress, the UPA government, that was actually the time where Dalits were only used for vote bank politics. There, there was no development, there was no progress or anything done for the Dalit community under the UPA. It is only after Modi ji came into power when the BJP is in power that the uh, Dalits have actually gotten a voice. They've become vocal. Their, their demands have actually been recognized. Otherwise, this, this was not, never happening. So I, I disagree yeah. uh, with that, that, you know, the, there's Savarna appeasement. Maybe there is Savarna appeasement, but in, in, in what way? In what way? Uh, e example, here in Telangana, we have Brahmin reservation. Would that come under Savarna uh, appeasement? Yeah, if I they're going the uh, uh, you know tam tam about it. Yes, maybe, but uh, but still, I don't think it matters to that uh, large an extent. But for sure, the subaltern community has definitely gotten a voice. They're able to assert themselves as Dalits and as Hindus. That is the most important thing. So you do see that, uh, you know, because uh, first there was that identity separation that, uh, you know, the uh, in, in Karnataka, there's a particular term for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, they call it Ahinda, where you separate uh, the tribal identity, you know, the Dalit identity from the Hindu identity largely. Today, do you see that unifying largely because, because of the BJP's national presence? Yes. So personally, on the ground, I see that a lot. Um, in fact, there are so many videos that have gone viral where, you know, if evangelists come to a particular village holding their uh, Bible and everything, from small, small kids to grown-up people, everybody just chases them out by screaming, you know, Jai Shri Ram, Jai Shri Krishna, and they chase them out. Those videos are hilarious to watch. Small, small kids, will be, oh, they will hold like a slate or a, a bartan and they'll bang it with a, a spoon and keep screaming Jai Shri Ram and drive those people out of their uh, village. In fact, there are a few villages in uh, Andhra which have put up a board at the entrance saying that evangelists are not allowed in this village. So that's how uh, assertive they are uh, regarding, you know, their Hindu identity. Yes, they, they don't deny that they belong to the Dalit community or anything. But now I see that the subaltern community is first identifying as a Hindu, Hindu first, and then the Jati Varna later. Right. There's uh, one more topic that I would like to slightly touch upon. Uh, one is that uh, the trad versus Raita so-called gang war is going on. This is not my coinage, but uh, one of the uh, left media's coinage. So then, then I actually imagined you, Abhijit, and the others being gang leaders, you know, and then I couldn't help but laugh at the very thought of it. Uh, but is it actually that vicious and <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you can openly speak about this. Is it actually that vicious or it's just a healthy uh, banter that happens on social media, Kushal? I'll speak very openly. I, 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 yeah, I'm, see, my, so if you look at my social media, who are the people who abuse me the most? Look, I, I have such a privilege. I have a handle that is dedicated to hate me. Every time I tweet, that person writes a tweet. <laughs> Say, you to block them? I just mute them. I don't block people. I want them to read me and feel irritated all the time. I'm kind of a sadist <laughs> that way. <laughs> so I don't block people. Look, I am very clear. I am in my brain a certain type of Hindutvavadi. I am a mix of Ambedkar and Savarkar, both. And Vivekananda and Aurobindo and many others. Together, even 
Marishi Dayanan Saraswati and even Birsa Munda and everybody. I am a mixture of many people and even maybe at times Socrates and Epicurus. My clear view is this and I have always said this. I am pro-modernity. People don't like it, so be it. I like modernity. I think it has given many good things to us in life. I don't mind it. I am opposed to anybody who is an enemy of modernity. When I say I'm opposed to it, I say, oh, I'm not going to be wrong. No, no. Just intellectually opposed to it. And when you that's say all. modernity, you mean it in the Western sense because largely that's what it is today. Whatever. I believe modernity is a process where the moral arc keeps expanding and that moral arc keeps including newer and newer ideas. My base is I am for human flourishing. The idea that leads to human flourishing. And now we have extended it from humans to the environment and to all species under it, right? That's how the moral arc is expanding, right? And which religion recognizes it the most? We should all celebrate it. Hinduism recognizes it the most, right? We are all Hindus here. And the, the moral arc of the Hindu is actually what Peter Singer started talking about in 1970s. But, you know, the Hindus or the Native Americans or the First Nation Canadians, you know, all, all these people were talking about it from such a long time, being one with nature and stuff like that. But yeah. at the same, uh, I am also a very open free market advocate. So I understand we have to change with times. But what is happening on social media, as far as I'm concerned, is look, what I call Hindu modernity, it's opposed to three branches. One is Islamo fascism or Islamism, whatever you want to call it. Number two is Western imperialism, where the West thinks its problems are global problems and nobody else's problem is even a problem. So that's Western imperialism. And number three yeah. is caste denialism or Jati Varna denialism. These three are my intellectual enemies and I don't <laughs> seek their approval. And I say this on every platform. So, you know, prayer, if you speak with me on WhatsApp or on the email, I will give you the same answer. Like Prerna knows my answers are always the same. I don't hide my views. Whatever I say on the camera is whatever I'll say. Mm -hmm. I have no personal animus towards anyone or anything. But I am refusing to compromise. And does that mean they call me a Raita? Look, Raita is very nice. It has Bundi. It has so many other things. So I am Raita. I am fine. If yeah. you want to call me Raita, I am fine. And my idea is that, I mean, the reason BJP is successful is explained beautifully at a political level in Nalin Mehta's book. Mm -hmm. I recommend everybody to read that book. The man has done a data dive and you know what Prerna said basically is true. It's a subaltern. BJP is a subaltern party and Hindutva right. is a subaltern movement. And if, if somebody had a misconception that Hindutva was not subaltern, then, you know, I... That's their problem, not somebody else's. Yeah. So as far as the trad and right, Raita debate is concerned, if somebody thinks that the Dalit should not enter a temple, they are my enemy intellectually. If somebody thinks endogamy is something great and a genius idea, they are my intellectual enemy. If somebody thinks any kind of active discrimination against women is something great and genius, they are my intellectual enemy. If that means I am a westernized, Christianized, secularized, thisized, thatized, I am. I don't care. I'm not seeking their approval. And I, I want to ask you a small personal question as well. Uh, because uh, uh, Prerna had to say something. So uh, oh, maybe yeah, Prerna can go ahead. Sorry, one second. I see how much uh, harsh Mother Susan and uh, Kushal get abused on twitter it's not just a they get abused the entire family seven generation backwards yeah. seven generation forwards gets abused yeah and still I, and i have immense respect for both of them because despite all this they still continue tweeting the same thing over and over and over they again do. and uh you know uh, unlike the left because uh one common experience that i've gathered from people talking uh, to people both intellectually on the left and the right is that all of them are attacked by the IT cell equally <laughs> or maybe the right even more so because, you know, they want to control a certain narrative and they don't want right speaking too much. These people are only the IT cell. No, you forgot yeah. Kushan and Harsh are only the IT cell. They get abused, <laughs> but they are the IT cell. They are BJP IT cell. Aray, and IT cell. Bula diya bhi. 
हाँ हाँ दे हैव बीन कॉल्ड आई हैव स्क्रीन शॉट वेर दीज पीपल हैव बीन अब्यूज देर फैमिलीज हैव बीन अब्यूज but but can i admit at least the trad side some of them come up with the most amazing hilarious abuses even when the abuses are on me i find it so funny i can't stop laughing <laughs> like there was this survey there was this survey i am not making it up somebody did a survey who is a bigger doggy and the doggy was spelled d o g h h i e was it harsh madhusudan gupta or kushal mehra i clearly remember it was like 11:30 12 in the night i messaged <laughs> harsh i was like dekh cheating nahi karna like a good friend i voted for you you better vote for me and then let the best man win and i won that and then i can remember rubbing it into harsh i was like dekh i am the bigger doggy you lost it great <laughs> <laughs> very uh, toxic yeah, but, but one thing i really like is that the non left doesn't play victim as much because one of them even wrote a book about this how she was being trolled so you know it's actually ridiculous maybe all of you should co-author a book ha yeah, we should oh man if if i look if i start taking the abuses online seriously i would not be look i tell me do you think i the most vicious abuses i get is not from the trads they are from the khalistanis they are the worst creatures i have come across on social media mm. and they also threaten violently let mm. me uh, recently swaraj did that beautiful report on uh, in punjab uh, uh, on, on casteism in punjab and how urine was thrown on that uh, poor person yeah. uh, if you remember and i shared it and why did i share it because see for me when i say annihilation of jati varna annihilation of jati varna in christians in muslims in in sikhs in by the way if people think it doesn't happen in the buddhist circles it happens there too you know wha, 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 even let me tell you the entire periyarite movement and the new ambedkarite movement is a casteist movement because if your essence is hating the brahmin just because he happens to be a brahmin then you are a casteist you also are a casteist my dear sir if you think removing the janayu of someone is a great deed that you are doing and being violent with them and removing their vibhuti which they you know put on their forehead is a great do you sir are a casteist too i am opposed to all these people but the khalistanis abuse me the most because they have made this entire stick and marketing you know their entire marketing is what we are not ca- castes uh, we are the most equal yeah. and then when people like me you know they hate me is because i am punjabi so no thoda bahut to insider information bhi hai kind of a thing so they hate me with a passion and then i point out ki bhai you are dominated by jet sikhs it is you know it is jetism it is not sikhism what you guys are practicing is jetism the gurus are mine as much uh, the gurus are sharans the gurus are prerna's sikh gurus are ours not theirs not the mm. khalistanis they are our gurus you know they are every single indian's guru and this is why i am so vehemently opposed to jati varna as a structure is because i see it like the pashmanda muslims i was the yeah. first dum dum who got the pashmanda topic on social media literally i know mm. people c- credit to someone else you can go and look at the time stamps <laughs> i was the first one to talk I was the first one to raise this issue when I invited Fayyaz Ahmed Fazi, and I told Fayyaz, "Nay, aao, mere se baat karo." Yeah, and and then you know, Amna has come, Amna has spoken, and I have tried to speak about it. I am not talking about annihilation of Jati Varna just in the so-called Hindu. I am talking about the annihilation of this entire structure. It's the most useless thing, man. And as far as the trads are concerned, my message to them is: keep the abuses coming. I don't care. do you see a uh, uh, shift in terms of so uh, i i come from an ir background so i've done geopolitics and foreign affairs and all of that so we study different schools of thoughts um uh that applies to certain individual leaders and on how they pursue their foreign policy pursuits and all of that right so maybe you can call watchpai to a certain extent an idealist also a realist who conducted the pokhran nuclear test and all of that so there are these different uh, uh, you know diff- different schools of thoughts that can actually be applied for modi it is uh, so- somewhat of a of an aggressive realist because he comes from a background where he was actively persecuted by the press uh, institutionally he was oppressed 
his close aide was uh, ousted from Gujarat. Uh, so these people have been through a lot. Today it seems like a cakewalk, and everybody's conveniently forgotten it. But in the in the last few years, uh, do you think there is a realization within Modi or within Modi's BJP that perhaps things have heated up a little bit in terms of the communal discourse that's there, and perhaps which is why you are seeing a lot of uh, uh, appeasement in terms of uh, suspensions of party people when it comes to Nupur Sharma episode. Now, Raja was suspended uh, recently. I don't know what is going to happen in Hyderabad. Uh, and uh, he's being more friendly with Bollywood people and, you know, he's being more friendly with journalists. Uh, so, you, do you see that awakening of a watch in Modi? Or how do you observe this recent uh, phenomenon, you know? Because I, I see that change. I, I clearly see that distinction between that Modi uh, as a prime minister in between 2014 and probably 20 and in the last couple of years. I don't know. I think it's a very hard thing to judge. If you ask me personally, I think the prime minister, I mean, he still doesn't speak to any of your mainstream journalists. So I don't know how close <laughs> he is to mainstream media. I mean... Does he speak to any mainstream journalist? I mean, the only interviews he's given is either to Swaraj or uh, Akshay to Pandey. ANI. Yeah. <laughs> Akshay Kumar. Are, how can you forget Akshay, that? Are, ha, Akshay Kumar. Yaar. See, so, so, so sorry. My fellow Canadian Akshay Kumar. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, other than that, he has only given interviews to Smita Prakash. So, I don't know if he's friendly hmm. to the media in that sense. He still ignores the media. He only talks to the people he wants to talk to. Yeah. I think, see, with Narendra Modi, you can never set the terms. I mean, hmm. Narendra Modi sets the terms, people follow Narendra Modi. As far as the communal discourse in India is concerned, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, if you ask me, this is the last straw. I mean, if personally, I'm very critical of the way BJP has handled it. I think BJP, I mean, to have, I don't know, I, I think eventually it might end up with somebody like me is going to go to the courts and, you know, we need to stop this Sartan Se Judah menace. I, I think I'm going to go to the courts and ask the courts of India. Uh, I'm going to try and do it the right way. First, go to the legislatures, write something and ask them, Ki, boss, is Sartan Se Judah allowed in this country? And if they don't reply, I'm going to go to the courts. I, I am definitely doing that. I'm just patiently waiting what happens. But my, I am very critical of the BJP. I mean, anybody who comes to my podcast knows that I am so frustrated that you live in a country like India where you cannot question religious prophets or religion, but on the feeling that somebody did and then you supported the right of that somebody to do that, that something, you will go and kill that someone and then every second or third day you will have someone going around saying sartan se juda sartan se juda and the bharti janta party does not do anything about it look what the bjp does is obviously a political party cannot keep members who say nonsensical things but it depends on what nonsense is said now political parties have people saying nonsense all the time it is you know yeah. what nonsense makes the news it's all of that. You know, are we saying that Congress does not say nonsensical things? Now, hmm. who was that guy, Imtiaz or something, who had said, uh, Suli pe chada dena chahiye, Nupur Sharma ko. Did hmm. all India majlise muslimin remove that person? He's still in the AIMIM. Hmm. Only BJP is holier than thou. BJP has removed. I am not, uh, full disclosure, I am no fan of this gentleman, Raja Varma or whatever his name is. I am no fan of that gentleman. But my point is only BJP is doing now. BJP will work on its own value parameters and value structures. Now, whether you like it or not is Swad Anusar. I, I, I personally feel that BJP should not have fired Nupur Sharma. Nupur did not say anything egregious. As far yeah. as Raja Sharma is concerned, my opinion varies. I think to be very honest, the reason I don't know that person's name is how irrelevant that person is to me in my brain structure, to be very right. clear. Uh, and, yeah. and I, and, uh, and I'm glad that I'm saying I'm not a fan of that person. So that now this video gets choices of abusers from excited online Hindus. Because I, <laughs> yes. So, uh, one of the reasons uh, that the BJP was silently giving through its uh, media spokespeople is that, uh, 
there are diplomatic complicalities uh, which arises when certain uh, you know incidents like the nupur sharma incident happens uh, one is that is the fact that uh, i perhaps i think diplomatically we are at our best relations with the middle east uh, west asia uh, in recent times as far as that is concerned so i don't really know if this actually affects that uh, those ties uh, to that level of an extent perhaps and secondly when i see leaders like macron who is openly standing up for uh, absolute free speech and this is a western society that we are talking about i don't see why in india we actually fail to do that or perhaps can it also be said that there was no absolute uh, free speech in india or the concept is very alien i i don't think we never had uh, free speech here the way you know it's meant to be in india i would categorize india as the one country which has the lowest amount of uh, you know freedom for, of speech and expression a, a political party instead of supporting its own cadre or cadre like they call it here instead of supporting their own cadre they actually had them fired so they're endorsing the fact that what nupur sharma said and what raja singh said is wrong okay and when you as a political party when you say that this is wrong what they have done that makes them you know uh, susceptible to being attacked more yeah by muslims and you know by the crowd in general they are crowds over here in hyderabad that are going berserk and stone pelting the police because of what raja singh had done and mm. raja singh got a, a bail hearing and he got his bail like on the very same day okay yeah. so now they are angry that he managed to get bail so i don't think in india we've got any freedom of speech or freedom of expression yeah. first of all that blasphemy law itself is very problematic on top of it people's understanding of what free speech is and for uh, free you know expression is over here that is also very flawed here yeah so, yeah i don't believe we have it another so, yeah, I mean, imagine right in the case of america if uh, america were to turn the guns on rusty and said are tu kyu likha pehle tere wajah se ye sab ho raha hai you deserve to get stabbed are hey, bhai are in india mein to bhai dawkins award winner shri shri 50000 sitaro wale javed akhtar Uh, he in 2018 on an NDTV interview says Rajdi should not have done that and he gets a Dawkins award bhaiya aise mat bolo so you know please respect our public intellectuals he is so amazing he basically bhaiya this is another trad versus raita debate you know there are 15 people in this country who are for free speech unfortunately sabse zyada gali mere ko aur anand ranganathan ko milti hai pata nahi kyun sir main aur anand hi gali khate rehte hain ispe bhi <laughs> You you have any discussion on free speech? Even if I have not commented on it, or Anand has not commented on it, somebody will come and start abusing us. You you too. Yeah. So, pure and labeling ho raha hai abhi liberals yes. ka. So what do you do, man? In India, not do the liberals stand for free speech? BJP to you know, I mean, the less I say, the better. <laughs> BJP stands for free speech. What nonsense! BJP कब से free speech के लिए हो गई? India ah. see in. India does not have a conceptual understanding of free speech. You know hmm. what we have is I like to call India is a country of सस्ते stalins. <laughs> yeah. हर शाख वो हर शाख पे उल्लू नहीं बैठा है यहाँ पे हर शाख पे stalin बैठा है. <laughs> Everybody wants to control the other person and they want to make sure what the other person says. You know, then there are you know muppets like me who keep talking, keep and and you know i get abused by everyone i will talk to my left wing friend you know you know how the discourse has come down to i get private messages from my left wing friends you are doing very good job on your podcast ha huh? when you criticize this idea also i was like why don't you do it i don't know i will get cancelled i am not making these are <laughs> these are people who are proper leftists hmm. and they are my friends they will hmm. never say it in the public It, yeah. and then you will have some non left people who don't want to be called raita or trad or get involved in it they just want to be nice to everyone then they will say acha hua tune ye caste ke upar bola ye to galat baat hai aise to tu kyun nahi bolta nahi main nahi bolega it is a it, it, it is human nature i don't know what to do i will go on doing my own thing tomorrow if they don't like it they will block me and remove me or whatever <laughs>
uh finally uh, a, a departing message to our millennials because we live in such a sharply polar political environment uh without blaming anybody or with blaming everybody uh what would what would your message be to younger audience who hate you and who love you Great i'm asking course. this to both of you um for millennials i think they need to uh, stop having this you know alter ego on uh, social media whereas in reality their personality is completely different this is something i have noticed repeatedly with these people only their alter egos come out on social media but if you meet them you know in the real world outside of social media they are a completely different person this has we have noticed this even during the bully by case if you remember sharan Uh, you and i had had a discussion on this where that boy who was actually arrested he used to give big big threats to everybody on social media i'll do this to you i'll do that to you like open threats on social media but when the cops took him for intro- interrogation he was peeing in his pants so this this is the thing they they act like you know really macho on social media but in reality they might be like 40 kilos skinny little people the other day harsh was getting abused so badly harsh's wife harsh's family everybody was getting abused i told him only one thing you know for all you know that guy must be like 40 kilos and must be studying in some stupid uh, college insignificant college or doing some job that doesn't even matter so this is this is what they are in real life but on social media they act you know all chad and everything they can't even get themselves a, a girlfriend if it if it wasn't for arranged marriages <laughs> these people would be single these wankers would have been single all their life so they need to get a reality check i think all of them suffer majorly from cognitive dissonance so they need to go in for therapy if they feel like that about caste about women so anything which is which we don't talk in public they go and talk on social media right from menstruation to kama sutra to uh, you know uh, caste discrimination to uh, sati child marriage or anything that's considered regressive in today's modern world they go and discuss that and see how good it is including open defecation how can i forget <laughs> oh i thought you missed out on the conversation kuchal and i were having you were in there but we were actually discussing that <laughs> yeah so these people need to get a hold of their life you know reality check is needed often that's my yeah. message Let's get a reality check canada or so hyderabad ko vanakkam thank you so much this has been so much fun uh, and uh, very educative for me very informative um, i hope we can connect on more such sessions and uh, hopefully harsh will join us next time yeah, yeah I, i will i will bully i will bully harsh into joining me <laughs> yes, you should. You should. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, please do stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Do let us know in the comments of what exactly you thought, and if you have any negative feedback for us, please direct it towards Kushal. <laughs>